I'm Corey Creekmer, one of the uh, co-directors of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar. Um, and here very informally, again, welcoming you back. Um, I'm glad the weather is behaving a little better today for us. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, by all accounts, uh, not just my own perception, yesterday was a terrific um, set of events. People were, were really pleased. And I think today is going to be just as exciting. Um, I know you've all got programs, but let me just sort of um, um, remind you of what we're doing today and, and push on a couple of things uh, in just a second. Uh, one of our um, esteemed guests, Julian Chambliss, will speak. And um, later this afternoon at 2 o'clock, Rachel Williams, uh, who many of you know uh, is, is no longer at the University of Iowa, but uh, uh, was at the University of Iowa for a long, long time. And, and we're, we're delighted to have Rachel here. I, I wanted to explain just really quickly that one of the goals of the, uh, the public events connected to the Sawyer Seminar, this is the second, we'll have two more next semester, uh, we were determined in each case to bring together um, scholars and artists, uh, getting critical and creative perspectives. In this case, it occurred to me, all three of our guests could easily be identified as scholar artists. Um, they they you know, cross the divide between critical and creative work. Um, and so um, they, you know, each of them in their own way embody what we were trying to do uh, on the whole with, with our guest. Um, and I also want to emphasize that today, uh, each of our uh, guests will be introduced by one of the graduate student participants in the Mellon Sawyer Seminar. And then we will end today at 4 o'clock, or at 3 o'clock, uh, with a panel discussion with, with all of our guests, uh, also led by one of our graduate students. So I'm particularly pleased that we're um, faculty kind of uh, ran the show at our last event, and I'm, I'm very pleased we've got our graduate student participants um, front and center uh, this time. So I'm going to turn things over and uh, uh, a more proper introduction to um, Professor Chambliss with Uche. Thanks, everybody. Hi. Thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure today to introduce all of you to Dr. Julian Chambliss who's sitting up here front and center. <laughs> uh, Julian Chambliss is an urban historian, curator, and Afrofuturist scholar studying cityscapes real and imagined, pop culture, and comics history. He today is the steward of one of the largest comic collections in the world at, the, at Michigan State University. Uh, and he used this comic book collection to stage his digital humanities scholarship, the project Comics as Data in North America, this project is, of course, only one of many contributions that he has made across the disciplines, including his curated exhibition, Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics, and his edited collections, Ages of Heroes, Eras of Men, and Assembling the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He has made his way to the English Department of Michigan State University by way of Florida, studying urban history at Jacksonville and then at the University of Florida before teaching in the history department at Rollins College. Uh, his recent work focuses on Afrofuturism and the Afro-fantastic. Chambliss's work looks beyond the obvious to locate white supremacist logics and Afrofuturist imaginaries in places that we might not otherwise think to look. His talk today, Rethinking the Critical Afrofuturist Framework, Comics, Futurity, and Black Counterpublics Promises to Do More of the Same. Please join me in welcoming Julian Chambliss. I have to say how much I am always shocked when people read a bio of me, because I'm like, who's that person they're describing? <laughs> it's really interesting. That guy sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I will always start out a talk by like, lowering expectations. I know, I know, but I'm following up an incredible talk yesterday, and I hope to rate, you know, meet, meet some of the high marks. But I have to say that I want to thank um, the organizers here, the Overman Center for Advanced Studies, uh, special thanks for all the people doing the hard work of making something like this happen. This is an incredibly um, meaningful gathering of people to think about comics and think about racial reckoning. And I'm really honored to be incorporated and included in this conversation. I will say that my talk today is speculative. And by speculative, I mean I'm exploring some thoughts I have myself about the intersection between Afrofuturism and comics. This is a preoccupation with, my, with me, and both in terms of my research and my 
critical making work, which is something I would talk about in the context of this talk. But because Afrofuturism is a complicated subject matter, I think one of the things that I want to sort of bring to the fore is that my proposition is that in the U.S. context, I want to explore how Afrofuturism promotes or prompts us to rethink comics production as a practice of futurity and recovery. These two ideas, futurity and recovery, are very important to my own thinking about Afrofuturism and also in structuring my approach to the work of Afrofuturism. What I mean by this, of course, is that recovery in this sense is the action of process of regaining or the possession or control of something stolen or lost. And futurity is like that sort of third definition, like when you look up futurity in the dictionary, the renewed or continuing existence, right? So for Afrofuturism in particular, the, 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 the effort here is to think about ways that blackness in particular can continue on into the future, right? Because of course the futurity narratives that we know well have no place for blackness. So this is all building off a really complex legacy of blackness and visuality. That is something of course that we think about endlessly, right? How are African Americans in the digital, in the record uh, depicted? Well, they're depicted through the lens of colonialism, slavery, and oppression. I really hear, I'm inspired by the work of people like Rebecca Wanzo, Keanu Whitted, and the really groundbreaking work of people like uh, Ian Gordon, who have think, thought about the ways that comics have really built, built themselves or have direct legacies through these long traditions of caricature and demeaning depictions of blackness that really characterize how we understand blackness in the United States and at some level globally. The challenge for us, of course, is to think about ways to deconstruct this. And obviously for Afrofuturists, there's a long, complicated history of theory and practice that comes to bear. One of the key figures that I think is important in understanding this is John Jennings. Jennings is a professor at University of Riverside uh, in visual culture. He is advocating and really sort of like framed something called critical race design studies, where he talks about it as a way to un uncover the ways that race intersects with a particular index of understanding discriminatory systems in the world. So the way he, he talks about critical race design studies is this cluster, as this, this diagram that he created suggests, this is an intersection, right? It's an interdisciplinary exploration of the ways that race acts as an oppressive force. So speculative design, cultural studies, uh, anthropology, visual anthropology, critical making, all these are important parts of that system. And all of them have to be uncovered and understood as part of a whole system. So Afrofuturism offers a, a kind of epistemological frame to support the work of understanding how race, the thing that is created in the context of a sort of Western imperial project, operates. This is always the thing I talk to my students about. It's always the thing I'm thinking about in the context of creating Afrofuturist themed work. The challenge here, of course, is, is married because the definition of Afrofuturism is a complex one. And I always think it's important to like go back to these original uh, definitional moments, in part because I think one of the things that's important in this process has been the expansion of Afrofuturism as a framework that includes more and more areas of interest and work. Obviously, Mark Derry's original definition in 1994 is historically specific. The term that he coined is, at some level, deeply indebted to an understanding of history. And we should always recognize that Derry's critical assertions here are framed in reaction to the transformation happening at the end of the Cold War and the emergence of a global economy. Nonetheless, his critique is meaningful because it's layered with the understanding of the black experience in that Western colonial context. He talks about black people being descendants of alien abductees, using the experience of the Middle Passage, slavery and abduction as a sort of framework to understand that alien and alienation so intrinsic to the black experience. He also talks about uh, African Americans and people of African descent ex uh, existing in a sci-fi nightmare where unseen forces of impassable discriminant intolerance frustrate their movements. And of course, we can think endlessly about the contemporary instances of this and the long historical legacies that are built into the ways that black people and black bodies in public space are monitored, controlled, and sometimes dangerously affected. 
He also talks about the official history's undoing what has been done. So that fact, whatever contributions made by people of color are almost impossible to be understood. They are not documented. And those acts that are done are overlaid with distortions that perhaps today more than ever become important points of contestation that we have to take into account as we think about our civil society. And then, of course, technology is often brought to bear on black bodies. This point in particular is important because it, it sits at the cornerstone of the way blackness is thought of as anti-technology, in part because black bodies themselves are machines in the narrative of colonialism and imperialism of the Western experiment. These all represent, I think, incredibly complicated sets of historical certainties and observations they're important, but the definition of Afrofuturism um, talks very particularly about technoculture. But it's also important to recognize that that definition says might, for want of a better term, be called Afrofuturism. What Darrow was able to do was to think about the experience of black people in the Western context and the history that that is attached to it and recognize that black people must, in fact, have something other to say about the future. And in fact, that, that line from the from his um, definitional essay, black people have other things to say about future are important for any sort of Afrofuturist exploration. Those ideas are uh, connected to comics in a very particular way because of course, Derry used comics as illustrations in his essay. And he said comics were a place where Afrofuturism percolated, right? They were percolating in black written and black drawn comics. Almost immediately, the idea that comics were connected to Afrofuturism of those sort of dropped by the wayside as other forms of artistic expression gained the center of the discussion. Sound, in particular, um, more formal fine arts uh, also. But nonetheless, I think comics have an important place, to, an important point, part to play in our consideration of Afrofuturism. And I want to think about this in the context of how the, the definition of Afrofuturism has expanded from Derry. Obviously, Alondra Nelson's work is pivotal to this. And it's important to recognize while our publications like the Social Text, especially the Social Text in 2001, where she sort of introduced the idea of Afrofuturism as a sort of critique of modernity, she talked about it being a way to understand black Afri uh, Afri Afri diasporic artistic production. She talked about it as a way to understand subjectivity and alienation. And it's a black view on modernity She's doing so actually after having a very complicated set of conversations with a group of people that were a part of something called the Afrofuturist Listserv. And I call attention to this in part because one of the things about Afrofuturism I think continues to be central to its um, importance as a movement is that it does not exist totally inside the academy. Indeed, from the very beginning, Afrofuturism has been a collective exercise of scholars, of artists, of community members theorizing about the nature of blackness. While it's, we can't see the Afrofuturist Listserv anymore, if you can play around with the internet way back machine like myself, you can pull up the original landing page. And you can see that the definitions of Afrofuturism that are at play here and the questions that are being laid out back in around 1998 are important ones even for us today. This is an interdisciplinary group of people who are seeking to try to understand blackness in a different way. As they say, the speculation has been called Afrofuturism, the cultural production that simultaneously references a past or a, a, of abduction, displacement, and alienation, celebrates the unique aesthetic perspective inspired by these fractured histories and imagines the possible futures of black life an ever-expanding definition of blackness. And I think that is a crucial element here, that the definitions that they're seeking to create are expansive ones. They seek to deconstruct what blackness is apart from its sort of in colonial legacies and the implications of that. Later on, just in the very next year, Alondra Nelson wrote a piece for Color Line, which is a magazine where she talked about um, she said, she asked a very important question. Why don't we just look at the innovations and in technique and communication that can be found throughout the black diasporic culture if we want to understand Afrofuturism? That piece, Afrofuturism, <coughs> past future, past future visions, 
called attention to the ways that African-based artists might be using technology and might be using different techniques to tell stories of blackness that remain transformative, affirming, and push us to think about a different kind of future. These ideas are, of course, important for Nelson, but they also become important for us as we think about how Afrofuturism has rapidly accelerated as a theoretical space in recent years. The work of people like Ronaldo Anderson and Charles E. Jones in Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro-Blackness, makes a real clear distinction between a different period, a new period of Afrofuturism. Ronaldo Jones, uh, Ronaldo Anderson in particular, makes an emphasis between Web 1.0, which he associates with the period of the 1990s, versus Web 2.0, which is influenced by technological innovations associated with social media and the connecting of African American community or African diaspora communities through the internet in relation to activism and transformation and cultural production aimed towards liberation. This idea of Afrofuturism 2.0 is particularly important because it ties together what is essentially at the very beginning of somewhat African American idea to a global diasporic set of conversation around liberation. This is part of the reason why we, and I think in contemporary terms, think about Afrofuturism as a global movement, is because the ways that technology are allowing people of African descent to connect with each other, talk directly to each other, and create together around liberation. Anderson is probably one of the more um, active theorists of Afrofuturism, and I personally think of myself as following in his work very closely. I think it's meaningful when we think about his work recently because he was on the curatorial council of the Carnegie Hall Afrofuturism Festival in February 2022. Of course, Carnegie Hall is one of the most important cultural institutions in the United States, and they had the first ever Afrofuturism Festival, clearly a, a moment, a benchmark at some level. He created an online exhibition, not shockingly, called The Black Angel of History, where he talks about Afrofuturism as reaching a kind of crescendo in a very real way. And he talked about it as emerging as a high culture, as the high culture of transnational Pan-African subjective hum humanistic astro-blackness. Key to his understanding of this, this new moment in Afrofuturism is a kind of myth, myth science where he talks about the creation of new sets of understanding and approaches to under, uh, culture that are rooted in an African diasporic perspective. Anderson is also the person who I'm thinking about very directly when I talk about the critical Afrofuturism in comics, because he wrote about that in The Black or the Ink, where he had a chapter on critical Afrofuturism, looking very particularly at an Afrofuturist-themed comic. This is the, the piece that, at some level, inspired some of my thinking that led to um, my show, Beyond a Black Panther, that and the, the sort of centrality of Afrofuturism in comics and the original definitional element. There are many things that, that Anderson tries to do here, but again, he talks about Afrofuturism emerging as a nexus, growing from, again, a sort of collective experience of African diasporic culture, and he makes a, the modern Afrofuturism is a, goes out of the nexus of a migration, international and domestic social movements, conflicts, and influence of technology, black music, religion, and literature. He further talks about Afrofuturism uh, in other places as reaching in this sort of new moment, the opportunity to tell different stories across those different fields of endeavor, be it aesthetics, metaphysics, activism, social science, science, and, and, and community. These are the ways that Afrofuturism offers up important sort of um, moments of intervention and transformation. Uh, he goes on further, and I'm quoting extensively here in a bad way, but I think it's important to recognize that Afrofuturism can be located and can establish counter narratives, undermine, delegitimize the power of the Leviathan. And again, here as a critical theorist, he is offering up Afrofuturism as his own critical theoretical framework. It has the ability, he argues, to lead us to different paths. Ultimately, what happens with Afrofuturism is it decenters your, the Eurocentric approach and constructs and it helps us construct the nature of race and intersections of brown power. And it talks to us about these sort of current narratives and publics and the ways that whiteness are, are um, depending on controlling the other, all of which are quite a crucial to the Afrofuturist project. So 
this critical afrofuturist framework is, is central to this, this question of the heart, the hierarchalization, because it opens the door to a variety of activities that can, in fact, be used to elevate and transform our understanding of blackness. I think this idea is actually building off an idea that was offered by Kojo Oshun a little bit earlier in a very famous article called Further Considerations of, the, of Afrofuturism, where having written about 1998, More Brilliant Than the Sun, Kojo Oshun comes back to Afrofuturism in an article in the Centennial Review, and he talks about defining Afrofuturism as a program of recovering the histories of counterfutures created in a century hostile to blackness, and it's the critical work of manufacturing tools capable of intervention. Manufacturing tools capable of intervention. This in particular is meaningful because he talks about this in the context of something called the future industry. This is my sort of, you know, thrown together diagram to try to understand the future industry that he talked about. Key to that, the future industry is this sort of intersecting set of practices, techno science, fictional media, technological projection, market prediction. These things together work to create a kind of control through prediction. Both your imagination and the sort of practices that are associated with the way institutions operate tend to work in tandem to promote the, those, those, those in power to stay in power and those who are subjugated to remain subjugated. Science fiction is a part of that because of course the science narrative uh, that we're so, so popular in our experience does not open itself up to black people persisting into the future. He advocates that you must have something called a musicological turn. You must have something so startling that is not defined by the system in order for you to achieve something transformative. To me, this idea of the future industry has always been fascinating. And many times when I'm musing on what Afrofuturist sort of product or production is, I'm thinking about intersections with the future industry. Can we have a kind of black future industry, for instance, that can promote and transform and provide a pathway to a more equitable future? So at some level, that process of recovery is a huge part of the work that I do. Obviously, comics are an important narrative because they have are some very basic way. I think of them as an archive in the American experience, or in particular, I'm an Americanist, so I always you know, caution. And so the work that I've been doing recently has really thought about the ways that we can recover some of these narratives of counter futures that are offered by comics. And because comics are so popular, they become an incredible tool to readjust our understanding of blackness. Obviously, this idea is, is on display in Beyond the Black Panther, visions of Afrofuturism of American culture, American comics. Um, and I approach this with the idea that this, this idea of past innovation and future visions are two in the same. In the show, we actually use this idea, I use this idea to explore all Negro comics, right? One of the first comic books published by African Americans, Orrin Evans, and to explore the idea of Lion Man, who has been argued in literature as a kind of proto, like the Black Panther before the Black Panther. The elements of that story are particular in the sense that they point to a, a, a kind of comic-based narrative around internationalism that actually corresponds to the narratives of internationalism that people like W.B. Du Bois are making in the public sphere at the same time. At some level, Iron Man, uh, Lion Man and the narratives of sort of internationalization and UN-based sort of protection of indigenous people that are buried in that story are the same kinds of narratives that give rise to appeal to the world uh, where or W.B. Du Bois asks for UN intervention for African Americans and people of color around the world. So this is a way to think about comics as capturing a kind of forward thinking futurity that we may not necessarily always align with them. Obviously in that show, John Jennings created a series of comic book covers inspired by Lion Man where he takes what is essentially a one story and one issue and moves it through time, accomplishing very much what, what Kojo Oshun talked about as that musicological turn. Each cover of the Lion Man comic that he creates for the show is a Lion Man in a different era, responding to the problems and challenges of blackness related to that era. 
perhaps more complicated in some ways is the recovery of characters that are at some level, some level much less known. Recently, I've been working on a, a, a chapter in a book that's coming out by Connor Whitted, looking at a character called Neil Knight of the Air. Originally, Neil Knight was a um, World War II era fighter pilot in this comic strip that was published by Pittsburgh Courier. But he very quickly turns into a space age adventurer. Uh, we know much in terms of like when we think about um, black newspapers that the work, the great work uh, around uh, Jackie Ormus and other characters, uh, other sort of black newspaper characters. But this is a particular character because he is clearly a space age character. When Knight is reimagined as a space adventurer similar to Buck Rogers in the 1950s, he's doing so at a time where future narratives associated with black people are not available. His, his adventures are interesting because they are clearly future, future, futuristic narratives that precede the technological world of the Black Panther by a good 16 years. And he offered up a vision of black people in the future as heroes doing things that otherwise they could not do. Incredibly, while not well known, this um, comic is part of a, a huge group of comics that were public that were purchased by the Pittsburgh Courier, part of a, a syndicate created by the Smith Man. Um, these were full color inserts that had provided a number of different kinds of uh, uh, story characters, the secret agent adventure, the historical romance, the private eye, the fairy tale, um, puzzles, and of course, fact panels that were very common. All of which are positioned to provide information to a black audience that for the most part, did not have access to these sort of normative narratives, but of course never had access at some level to the futuristic narratives that affirmed to them that they would exist in a future space. When we look closely at Neil's nice adventures on the planet Trillium, he's a adventurer protecting uh, alien people from an aggressive expansionist power, lending his military know-how he had been a fighter pilot in the military, right? World War II, clearly referencing the Tuskegee Airmen. L lending his understanding of military taxes to help um, a minority group from an aggressive uh, expansionist power. Later on, after having, helping them defeat these expansionist power, he takes up the, the, the task of being an explorer and going to a new planet and getting involved in a series of ventures, primarily to add to human knowledge. Again, offering a kind of explorer narrative attached to African Americans that was widely not available, but inspiring, of course, for a black audience seeking to see normalized versions of themselves in the public sphere. While recovering stories like Neil Knight are important parts of the archival work that I do, I think it's obvious that for me, the creation of work around Afrofuturism is also important. If comics are anything, they're the most accessible form of a kind of visual culture that people both inside and outside of academia have access to. And in my experience, this becomes an important part of telling stories related to the archive. Um, for me, the comic narrative becomes one way that we can recover the stories that are fragmented across the archive and provide a way for them to be uh, opened to the public. In my previous work, I've worked with community members who are very interested in trying to capture the story of African-American communities in Florida. One in particular is the story of like one of the founding fathers of the community called Hannibal Square, which is now part of the town of Winter Park, Florida, but that town itself would not have existed without the activism of black Republican landowners like Gus C. Henderson. For more than 100 years, even though Henderson was one of the founding members who wrote, who signed the town charter, he was not known. And the loss of his narrative was incredibly difficult for the community to deal with, in part because their space was being gentrified out of existence. As we started to do more work in the archive and we were able to piece together the, the legacies of his contributions, like the establishment of the first black newspaper, 
um, one of the first black newspapers in Florida and the only newspaper in Winter Park, Florida in the 1890s, we were able to see a much fuller picture of how he as an individual was able to advocate for voting rights, uh, promoted civic culture, and asked for African-American participation in the public sphere in a way that was transformative and empowering. But at some very basic level, most people did not know. This is why when we were asked, we actually turned to comics as a way to document his story. We created a one-page um, bio-comic to tell the story of Gus Henderson. This was actually pieced together through uh, some of the own, his own biographical narratives that he published in his newspaper. And so as I pieced together the different, different snippets of his own life story, I wrote those up and worked with an artist to create this one-page comic that we gave to the community so they would have something that would be a kind of rallying point for um, their stories of community development and civic pride. And indeed, now Gus Henderson has been added to the sort of like founding father narrative of the city of Winter Park. And he continues to be an inspirational figure for African Americans who are struggling around questions of gentrification and space in a rapidly changing urban environment of Central Florida. These stories of the archive as a focal point using comics to sort of create community narratives are crucial to my approach, uh, especially because the history of Central Florida is one that has a lot of hidden narratives related to black trauma and black activism. Currently, I'm working on a secret project, but not secret anymore because I'm saying it right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, related to the, the lynching death or the lynching event of a man named Oscar Mack. Spoiler alert, he did not die. But there is a lynching narrative attached to his story. Mack was a World War I veteran who was threatened by the Ku Klux Klan in Kissimmee, Florida. He was actually a federal employee. It was a, there was a, a contract to move mail from the, po from the railroad to the post office. And he put in the low bid and won the contract. Upon winning this contract in Kissimmee, Florida in 1922, he was warned, if you show up for this job, you will be killed. If you show up for this job, you will be killed. The assistant postmaster, a white man, actually gave him a weapon and said, if anyone interferes with you trying to do your duty, you should use this weapon. He has showed up for the first day of work. Everything went fine. He went home. That night, three men showed up at his house. And there was an exchange of gunfire. He shot and killed two men. A third was wounded, and he disappeared. The narrative of Oscar Mack appears in the national press pretty much one way. A Florida man named Oscar Mack was hanged on July 18th, 1922. There are numerous headlines like, like this that appear across the country uh, in 1922. New York, LA, Oakland, in the South, in the Midwest, so on and so forth. Each one of these narratives gives scant accounts, but they make, sure, they make it clear that a man named Oscar Mack was hung on the road between Orlando and Kissimmee near a place called Lake Jenny Jewel. When we look into the records, Oscar Mack is listed as one of the people killed by the NAACP in their annual rec recordings of lynchings in the United States. But, as we did more research on this project beginning around 2013 and then continuing on in bits and fits and starts, um, we were able to find more and more information about the incident that led to the sort of confrontation between Oscar Mack and his accusers and how he may have escaped. Because indeed, while we were able to flesh out the details of the lynching event itself, we were able to trace the names of the people and the families associated with the people who attacked him. We were able to identify the sort of like cause that got the KKK uh, focused on him. We were even able, even able to uh, attach um, some motivations of some of the people involved in the lynching to a previous racial incident the year before 
much more famous Okoye riot where African Americans who attempted to vote in 1921 triggered an anti-black anti riot that drove all the black people out of the city of Okoye, leaving no black people in Okoye for more than 100 years. In some accounts they were able to uncover, those same people who were, that were involved in that incident were also the people after Oscar Mack. And the, the details that we were able to uncover in the archive, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people were milling around between July 16th and July 22nd looking for Oscar Mack as a part of a lynch mob that, whose, whose goal was to deal out punishment for someone who would dare to interrupt the racial order. Ultimately, though, what we came to understand is that Oscar Mack did not die. His family had a story from their great-great-grandfather about him having a secret life. And they contacted us because of a web, website that we created and let us know that this story that you published on your website, this answers a question that we have about our own family. And, we're, and, and we really want to talk to you about this and get all, the de get all the information from you. And indeed, we did do that. And all of this information is available through the Samuel Proctor Oral History Center at the University of Florida, where I work with, with my colleagues there. That's my alma mater and a great oral history center. We traveled to Ohio, which has turned out that's where Oscar Mack escaped to and changed his name to Lanier Johnson, spoke to the family, gathered their documents. And prior to the pandemic, we were working on a documentary um, to sort of like tell this story in its entirety. The, the story of his, his the challenge, the, the secret letters he wrote back to his future wife, his, his escape, and so on and so forth. But the pandemic sort of put, put an end to that. But even b before the pandemic, we did it, were able to sort of attend a, re a ceremony where they laid down a new um, headstone for him. This was a, a, a great moment for the family because they were able to solve the question of um, a kind of internal narrative of, of loss and tragedy and trauma associated with their, their grandfather. And it closed us, closed one door in terms of like questions that we had as, as researchers working, working on the case. But one goal for the family was that, that the story of Oscar Mack be a story that could educate and inspire a new generation of people. That was part of the reason that we wanted to pursue the idea of a documentary. But because comics are so powerful, we really started to think about the idea of a comic. And the Mini Death of Oscar Mack is a comic that we've been working on, on, the, on the, secretly as a way to document the story of Oscar Mack, but not necessarily retell the story in its entirety. Instead, what we want to do with this, the, the Mini Death of Oscar Mack is to delve into the sort of metaphysical trauma associated with being black in America to tell the stories of exclusion and tell the stories of endurance and the ways that black people survive, both from a kind of sort of metaphysical perspective, but also a sort of practical perspective in a fictionalized narrative that can be accessible to many people. Yes, I'm working with some actual professionals because I can't draw, but our goal here is one of transformative storytelling accessible to the public to inspire a kind of understanding of the legacies of race in the United States, but also to, to set a path towards trying to avoid the kind of systemic pressures that lead to the kind of any black violence associated with Oscar Mack. I turn to this approach in part because I believe ultimately that comics as a medium offer the opportunity to tell stories about the American experience that are inclusive and transformative, especially when they're taken through that Afrofuturist lens. For me, because of their role in visual culture, comics may be the best medium to answer some of the first questions posed by those participants in the Afrofuturist listserv way back in 1998. Is there such a thing as black techno culture? I think that you can see this being played out in some of the comics that are being created by black creators today. Are reoccurring speculative and science fiction themes in various genres of black culture production simply coincidences, right? I think at some level, this goes to this question, is there a black techno culture? And we can recover elements of that, I think, by thinking about the ways that the archive has 
hidden from us some of the narratives of science and, and technology championed by black people starting in the 19th century that we can only barely see today, but I think are very important elements of the ways that black people steeled themselves against the efforts of a kind of scientific racism of the late 19th and early 20th century. And of course, it's science fiction and speculative fiction the most appropriate genre for reflecting black experiences. I think at the end of the day, the answer to that question is, that's the only genre that can really tell the story of black people effectively. Because as Mark Derry pointed out at the very beginning, if we think about it, the experience of black people in the diaspora is an experience that is like a sci-fi saga. It is a novel unlike or perhaps too much like any sort of novel that we might imagine. I want to say that I, at the end of the day, while this talk was speculative, I want to call attention to the ways that the, the, medium, the comic medium's democratic nature opens the door to moments of mediation that allow us not only to see the consequences of colonial expectations, but work to create that the hard, the hard, you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> of culture necessary for liberation. This is why I think rethinking the, the critical Afrofuturist framework is so important because it suggests ways that commons can be at the forefront of that process of changing what blackness means in the American experience, not just simply, not just simply in America, but globally, because they, they have been central to creating the situation that I believe that could be central to changing it as well. So, thank you. Okay, I'm done. And these are the only superhero things I talked about, which is so sad. The only superhero pictures. I'm so sorry, because I love superheroes. All right, thank you for your talk. Uh, I found a lot of it fascinating, and I'm excited for the comic. But I was particularly interested by the section on futurity and the future industry, uh, where you lead in from the discussion of how Afrofuturism 2.0 is tied necessarily to this understanding of Web 2.0, this reorganization of technologies that led to broader interactions in a global sense between black people in the African diaspora. Uh, I know that, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, yeah it just dropped out. Uh, okay, there we go. I know that a lot of speculators on the, like, cusp of the future industry are very excited about the potentials of Web 3.0 as a, another restructuring of our life by internet technologies, one that's also represented by a mass of participation in the internet and an intercession of that participation by algorithmic technologies. I wonder if the advent of Web 3.0 is then in some ways calling for an Afrofuturism 3.0 is there a new frame that we have to use to resist the like ordering of our lives by technology that is still Afrofuturist? Yeah, I think that Afrofuturism 3.0 is the, the current discussion. Obviously, in the context of Afrofuturism 2.0 versus Afrofuturism 1.0, much of the assumptions about the use of technology by people of African diasporic descent is that they are using it in in opposition to the, to the mainstream. So in the discussions about Afrofuturism 3.0, I think one of the things that we're, we're currently sort of formulating is the ways that the, the structures and tools of, of the metaverse, for lack of a better term, are gonna be accessible for two African diasporic people. And that is not something that we have settled upon yet. Right, so if you think about the, the technologies at the core of some of these, these discussions, like blockchain, you think about the, the sort of questions around access to sort of digital infrastructure. Those remain at some level fundamental structural 
uh, barriers for a number of people around the world. And we still, I think, are debating the best way to ensure African-Americans or people of African descent around the world have access. There's a lot of activism around these things within these circles. And I, I'm one of those people who, are, who is, totally understands that this is going to happen. But I don't know that, that we have, at some level, defined the best set of tools to take up like Kojo Ashun's approach, the best set of tools that are going to be accessible to people of color around the world to, to ensure they, they reap the benefits of this transformation. And so that is one of the things that I often talk to, to people about Afrofuturism. You know, what can you do? There's always a question, well, how do I participate? Well, being better aware of the sort of regulations and discussions about things like cryptocurrency, about, you know, things like um, web... There's a term in my head that is long right now. Um, you know, access to the web. There's a term. The digital divide? No, that's no term. But that's true. <laughs> it's web equity. That's not the right term. But it's basically the FCC has a rule about how, how much access to the internet. And they've been debating about this. Web neutrality, that's the term. Damn it. <laughs> Web neutrality, right? So do you have access to the web the way that someone who's richer than you have access to the web? Web neutrality. Like the general thought has always been that we're supposed to be advocating for web neutrality, but that does not, that is not the case because of course corporations want to be able to tax people or you know, charge people to get better access to web neutrality. So web neutrality is always sort of like floating in the background amongst the FTC around this question of like, you know, access. So that's another one. And when we start talking about um, the metaverse, there are a number of, of creators who are, who are creating digital toolkits and, and creating digital products who advocate for African Americans to participate in that process. But they got to participate in that process. And one of the things that is a real barrier is that a lot of African Americans don't see themselves as sort of attached to that, in part because the way that African Americans have sort of been seen themselves in technology is like they're not, you know, they're any technology. And so hopefully one of the consequences of the current sort of activism around Afrofuturism is to get more black people more accustomed to, to sort of being a part of a technological conversation. But the ultimate answer to your question, at least from my perspective, is that we have not yet defined the best pathways for Afrofuturism 2.0. But people are working very hard to, to, to make sure these tools are available to African Americans. And if you're interested, you know, I would say just hit the internet and think about people like Dredd and Sneed, who has like a, a whole company sort of dedicated to Afrofuturism. Check out the, the, some of the people who participated in the Carnegie Hall Afrofuturism Festival. A lot of their things were online. A lot of technology people were there. Think about people like Lonnie Brooks, who's an Afrofuturist technologist, a futurist who talks about technology in, the, in democratic ways that it can, uh, can be made accessible to people. You know, he, he worked on a special, special issue of the Journal of Future Studies. All these people are talking about the ways that Afrofuturism and, and technology um, can be a tool to liberate and uplift. But it is an ongoing process. This is a, a, a something happening right now. And, and it's really important for all of us because ultimately an Afrofuturist approach is beneficial for everyone. Like I always tell students, you don't have to be black to be Afrofuturist. You, like, you don't have to be German to be Marx. You don't have to be German to understand Marxism, right? You don't have to be black to be Afrofuturist. So there's a way here that like understanding Afrofuturism's core goals of promoting liberation and, and promoting a society that's more caring, nurturing, and affirmative of everyone is a net good for all people on earth, right? And so, yeah, I don't, have a, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that question other than yes, I think we are involved in that conversation right now. And we're trying, I think, different people are trying collectively to ensure that black people around the world have access to those new, those new tools and that they're not controlled exclusively by a kind of global elite, right? Like, like Amazon or Facebook or people like that. Uh, that presentation was just so rich. Um, 
raises so many questions. But um, no, and Brian, no answers. Either. Well, <laughs> and particularly, I mean, uh, for me, such a vivid demonstration of the the significance of, of thinking about the historical past and future together. But I wanted to, to um, take up your sort of invitation towards speculation at the beginning and ask uh, you. You discuss Afrofuturism, um, you know, very uh, explicitly in terms of challenging Eurocentric. Uh, history and perspectives. Um, can you speculate um, on, if it's fair for me to ask you to go outside there, and think about the relationship, or, or say something about the relationship between Afrofuturism and Asia? And, and if you want to, you know, focus it down with comics, the connections between Afrofuturism and um, manga and anime, for right. example. But, you know, some of these discussions go back to things like Thinking about you know the Wu Tang Clan as a as this kind of Asian, you know African American uh, affiliation, but could you say something about how how Asia? I know it's a terribly large question, but factors into yeah, this. No, I think I think one of the things that weaves together the different narratives of futurism that we see emerging in the moment. So I I'm thinking here of like indigenous futurism, Desi futurism, which is sort of a South Asian futurism and Afrofuturism, is there sort of universal understanding of trying to decenter the, the, the colonial imperial experience? And so as a, as a toolkit, I think one of the ways that African Americans have taken on or affiliated and sort of recognized in Asian culture is a, a kind of cultural enrichment narrative that is connected very, very closely to things like hip hop because there are, there, are, there are certain practices where I think um, there's actually a great documentary that sort of talks a little bit about like the rise of um, the Shaw Brothers films in the 1970s, the rise of um, sort of black exploitation films at the same time, and the ways that black youth are watching both of those films and they're coming together and incorporating them into hip hop, right? Like when people are using some of the dance moves and things like that. So there's a, there's a key element here where a kind of um, effort to restore or effort to be in opposition to a, a structure that is hierarchical and um, demeaning, be it black people or, or Asian people, because remember, who are the first people, who, where is zoning in the American experience constructed on? It's constructed on Chinese people, right? Chinese laundry, those are the first zoning laws. So there's a there's a way where like the control and marginalization of of the Asian body in the American experience is an important sort of blueprint and practice that's imposed in terms of like creating the policy and practice associated with like segregation and zoning for black people. So for those groups, there is a commonality in terms of like trying to overcome the system. And I think for African Americans, they see within um, the kind of expertise and power associated with like martial arts and this, the Asian culture, a kind of counterpoint to the assumptions that are associated with sort of European Western um, thoughts of supremacy, right? And and we can see that with something like like you say like the Wu Tang Clan, right? Like what is the Wu Tang Clan? Like the Wu Tang for the babies, right? Like it's 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 it is a community centric thing that mirrors a lot of the same practices that Chinese communities had in terms of their own self help, self help, benevolent society, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a, a way where like just simply being opposition being in opposition to those hierarchies that that marginalize the meaning and control is a commonality that that will weave across them. And as we get these different kinds of futurism, as I say, and they're exploding at some level, um, I have a colleague that studies Armenian futurism. And for Armenians, you know, she talks about like this is a way for them to get at yeah, some level move past theorizing Armenian identity just simply around the genocide, right? That, that there is a way here that we have to think about is there a future, a future Armenian identity that can flourish and sustain and be transformative. And I think interestingly enough, she puts a lot of emphasis on female writers creating space to think about identity and, and community in a different way. And so I think that's a way that we can try to understand the commonalities across these sort of futurist movements. Hopefully that kind of answers your question, but maybe not. I said it was speculative talk. I never lie. I'm making it up as I go along. 
thank you. That was just an extraordinary talk as a digest of the field and then the way you're advancing it. So thank you. Just to think it. Um, I had a question uh, about um, what felt like a provocation towards the end, where you're saying speculative and, and science fiction is sort of an especially valuable genre to pursue for Afrofuturism. I'm just wondering, it, it strikes me that there are, and I don't know enough about the comics world, but there are a number of black creators who are turning to horror and, and the gothic to sort of recuperate the past, rethink the past. I'm thinking of like in, in literary fiction, Victor Laval and Matt right. Johnson, uh, Jordan Peele's films. And Nope has that weird combination of sci-fi and, and horror. So I just wondered, could you talk a little bit more about Afrofuturism and, and horror as a, as a resource for contemporary creators? I have a colleague, um, Kenitra Brooks, who talks about Afrofuturism as a theory of time. As a, as a theory of time, I think one of the important elements of Afrofuturism is recovery. But as she points out, one of the things that needs to be accomplished in that, that process of recovery is figuring out what to let go of. And so the turn towards what uh, John Jenny refers to the ethnogothic is about trying to understand what were the tools that were employed by people of African descent to survive the traumas associated with colonialism and imperialism and its legacies. And um, horror becomes a, a space where the tools of working that out, both sort of identifying and reconciling the trauma and then sort of like letting it go, seem to be playing themselves out, right? So the dread that black people feel about a kind of Eurocentric society, which isn't really gone away, right? Like one of the things about um, trauma is that we can, we're continually trying, coming to understand that that idea that black people are being trauma, have trauma or being re-traumatized is integral to their experience. So, you know, why do African-American women um, have higher rates of like birth, you know, deaths and things like that? Like, you know, is there the, the research that you, you see coming out about like the, the presence of stress in African-American life? These are all ways where the, the literal idea of the nature of those impassable forces that Mark Derry talked about, right? Like you're always under surveillance. You know, black people as a rule have to, even if it's just as an abstraction, consider today I might be shot randomly by the police. If you, most, if most people had to stop and go, today I might be randomly shot by the police, they would really start to think about how the police operate. But realistically, black people think about that all the time. Not in a way that's crippling because they don't have a choice, but they do think about it all the time. So what is the consequence of that kind of invisible pressure, right? Um, I think one of the interesting things recently I saw that Renato Anderson talked about, uh, W.B. Du Bois is um, the souls of black folks really offering up a kind of metaphysical interpretation of that same thing. Like that veil is just a metaphysical interpretation of like the idea of surveillance and anti-black feeling, right? And for us as a society, Afrofuturism is sort of stepping in and using these narratives of, of trauma and horror to personify these experiences and at some level, um, create a moment of like closure, right? Like how do you defeat the invisible specter of like surveillance? Well, if you personify it and then like you survive it, like how do you survive is a legitimate question when you have a system that is seemingly completely hostile to you, right? And so I think that's one of the ways that horror is sort of taking the forward. It's, it's, it's accessible, uh, I'm not a horror fan myself. I will just really admit that, but I do understand why horror and the sort of gothic um, resonates with so many people, right? Because it is a way for African Americans to personify these sometimes hidden forces of oppression and 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 give 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 substance to them in a way where they can be dealt with. In some in, in so many instances, you don't ever get to deal with it. Like you just sort of have to live with it. And I think that's part of the reason why it happens so much. This is the, la the last question. 
Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I've been working with the Iowa Women's Archive here in University of Iowa and with uh, friends of Martin Luther King in Ambrose University. We were, we will, no, we were, <laughs> sorry, we were building lesson planning for elementary schools here in, in some districts in Iowa. And while well, we encountered a lot of challenges, first, it was really hard to find archives, pictures, uh, primary sources around uh, African American diaspora. We worked with scholars here that was very helpful, and we made amazing lessons, and they're going to be in schools next year. And then we're moving forward to high school. And I never thought that comic could be like an amazing way to introduce subjects about, you know, we're starting talking about civil rights movement. So um, I, want, I wanted to ask you if you had any experiences in Florida with comics in school, right? Oh, yeah. So use us material for learning history and, and critical history. Yeah, we, we uh, over the years, we've done a lot of things with comics in schools. Obviously, um, Martin Luther King is a prime example of that. March is another great example. Um, I, I've used the uh, Martin Luther King bus boycott story, right? Like, it's a, it's a great comic, right? Working with local history, right? Ah, you were talking right. about Max. So, and... so the challenge there is you kind of got to know the local history. And then there's the, you know, can you find an artist? Like, so in the cases where we, you know, part of the reason I started making comics is because we have this effort. I'm trying to say, I'm trying to uh, give the community something they could see. You know, in the documents, you, could, you, you get one version of history. So, for instance, there are almost no pictures of the early, the late 19th century black communities in Florida, some of them will work, no pictures. You only have people sort of like remembrances that are passed down through time. So when, when, when people are describing it, you know, you, you basically get an amalgamation. Like, okay, well, let's draw it, right? Let's, let's use, and there have been great projects sort of recreating digital Harlem is an example of that. Um, and... A lot of tools now are more accessible, like UD Engine, so you can draw these things. So if you can get a group of people in the room, comics are simple, computers are hard, right? If you find an artist and go like, hey, here's a, here's a little one-page narrative, I want a one-page or do this, this the, 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 he can make, they can make it, they're very talented. If you want to try to create a 3D thing of a place, then it gets a little bit more complicated. You can do it, but it takes a little bit more time. So comics is super democratic, right? Like everyone can sort of like get into that. And so as long as you have the documents and you have um, a, the time, you can make comics. You can actually have kids make the comics, actually. You know, and I would really emphasize giving kids the opportunity to do it, actually, because they can tell stories from their perspective that can really resonate with people. Uh, we did different kinds of projects. I mean, if, if kids like to draw, uh, I would, you know, use, use their, that, that, that ability to draw and maybe bring in an artist to, you know, create some stuff around that. But, like, I would do that. Like, that, that gives kids the opportunity to really tell their story. And it could be married to more sophisticated material that you might create. You know, there are lots of different approaches, like photo photo essays, you know, um, oral histories where they, you have kids interview family members about the place so they can get, like, their version. I mean, I would, there's a hundred things you could do, but I would say that there's lots of opportunity for you to create things if, you're, if you have the time and the resources that, that can support it, right? There's a lot of history in people's shoeboxes under their beds. Like, and I, and I mean that very deliberately. So many communities have pictures and little little snippets. If you were to bring those out, you know, it might be a picture of someone's aunt at their, you know, birthday party, but they're up in the street. So there's a picture of the background. Like, okay, well, that's how I actually, how I actually look. And you could piece those together and tell really interesting stories. So those are things that, you know, I've had experience doing, but... You can do it. You just have to have the time and the resources to, to do it. Hopefully that was helpful. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was. Okay, everybody. It's time. It's the time. 
to eat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julian. It was a fantastic presentation.